Well, good afternoon, uh, students. Good to be back with you in the book of 1 Thessalonians. So we continue with uh, Paul and his letters, and we are nearly there. We're up to Thessalonians. We're going to cover the introduction to 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to cover 1 Thessalonians today. And then next week, Lord willing, we will finish off with 2 Thessalonians. And then we will have done all the way from uh, Romans to Thessalonians in this semester. So uh, let's um, pray and then we will continue. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this, these letters of Paul to the Thessalonians and thank you for what we can learn from this church, an exciting church, Lord, a young church, but a church that was already growing and and being a witness for you. So we pray, Lord, that we ourselves would be enthused again with uh, the gospel, with ministry, to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, as I was saying in my prayer, this, this is an exciting church. The, the church in Thessalonica was actually an exciting church because Paul spent very little time there and very soon afterwards, they already had a reputation of being um, a church that was growing and a church that was serving and a church that was witnessing. Um, their love was being known, their faith was being known, their hope was getting known um, beyond them in, in the region of Macedonia. So uh, a young church having an impact is an exciting thing for us to think about. But I want to show you that a little bit in um, Acts chapter 17, how the church began. So if you can turn with me to Acts chapter 17, in fact, I'll start reading Acts chapter 16, verse 40. Um, this is, um, as it says in your notes, this is uh, actually during Paul's second missionary journey. The notes have third, but it's actually the second missionary journey when he visited Thessalonica and had been released from prison in Philippi, or Philippi, which is what we looked at before. All right, Acts 16, verse 40. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they, they encouraged them and departed. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Ap Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, and as was his custom, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. So, um, the church in Thessalonica was established in that way, in a, in a situation of persecution, immediate persecution, immediate conflict with the Jews. Immediately there were riots being stirred up. And so, Paul and Silas had to depart from Thessalonica in a hurry. Um, it was all of a sudden. It wasn't how he would have liked it. 
So Paul didn't have time to teach them very much. He was only there for a few weeks, a couple of weeks. And um, so as a follow-up, he wrote the first letter and then another follow-up, the second letter to the Thessalonians. So what we're going to do um, today, um, as you have in your, in your study guide, we, we're going to look at the issue of authorship of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. We're going to um, look at the um, arguments for and against. We're going to look at the time and place of writing, the occasion and purpose of writing. We want to be able to also fit it into the historical account in Acts, and that we've really already begun to do. So, looking at authorship, both the letters state actually that Paul, Silas and Timothy were the co-authors, and we've seen that before when we've been studying in Philippians and Colossians. Um, and so 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1, you can turn to Thessalonians now, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1, Paul, Silvanus or Silas, two different, two alternative names, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the Church of the Thessalonians. And, and 2 Thessalonians starts the same. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the Church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so it's very clearly stated that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy are the co-authors. But of course, um, it becomes very clear that Paul is the primary um, speaker, the primary author. Um, so even though the plural is used many times, the we is used many time in, times in both 1 and 2 Thessalonians, um, the first person is also used, and it's Paul himself who says that he signs with his own hand at the end of 2 Thessalonians. So... Um, Silas and Timothy contribute in some way <coughs> because they they know the, the Thessalonians and they're with Paul. But the voice that we hear in the letters is that of Paul the Apostle. Um, the authorship of 1 Thessalonians has been widely accepted as coming from Paul. It, it, 1 Thessalonians is part of the, the critical canon of authentic Pauline letters, the so seven Pauline letters that, that even the critical scholars do not dispute. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is, is one of those. But there are some who argue that there have been additions, uh, extensions that have been made to the original letter. And uh, most of them would claim that 1 Th Thessalonians 2, 13 to 16, is an addition to the letter written later than the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Um, so let's read those verses. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 16. And you will understand why people would want to say that this happened after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sins. But the last verse here is what counts. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. So what is that supposed to mean? Um, that's the, the phrase that captures the attention of the critical scholars. So they would argue that what has come upon the Jews at last is the destruction of Jeruz Jerusalem in AD 70 kind of a, a judgment that has come upon them. But there's actually no evidence that these verses were, were added later on and not part of the original letter. These verses fit into the context. We even read from verse 13. It just fits in uh, very smoothly with what 
uh, from verse 13 up to 16 and even before that uh, the context is, is is quite suitable for that passage to be where it is in the letter and this wrath that comes over the Jews within the context doesn't have to point to the destruction of Jerusalem but rather that by rejecting the Messiah and the gospel the Jews as a matter of course then uh, uh, suffer the consequence of rejecting the salvation of God so that's on the authorship of 1 Thessalonians uh, not disputed but there is this um, argument that a part of it is not from Paul because, and it was added later because it seems to tie in with the destruction of Jerusalem then the authorship of 2 Thessalonians um, there's a lot more debate about this and you'll see in your notes there's a number of arguments that we will just briefly summarize um, or identify uh, today um, there are all these different arguments the first argument is the style and vocabulary are distinctive when you compare it with the other accepted letters of Paul but when you listen to the arguments of the critical scholars they come to such a wide variety of conclusions that that wide variety actually works against their argument because they can't agree on how they disagree on Pauline authorship so that's the first argument style and vocabulary different but exactly how they're not sure the second argument is that there are alleged details of a post Pauline period in the letter so for example the first example the eschatology of Paul in 2 Thessalonians re resembles that of Revelation which would have been written around AD 95 so much later um, and here it's argued that uh, the man of lawlessness the son of destruction mentioned mentioned in 2 Thessalonians reflects the Nero Redidivus myths that circulated around AD 68 and later so later on than than Paul so it seems like so now that we're saying there's words coming into this into two Thessalonians that don't belong to the period of Paul they belong to a period later than that and thirdly they would say that there's this realized eschatology and and the issue of laziness of the Thess Thessalonians which uh, reflects Gnosticism of the late first century so that's the argument number two uh, but the answer to that is that contemporary analysis of apocalyptic literature tends to show that the man of lawlessness isn't Nero nor a reference to the Nero Redditivus myth the eschatological, teach, eschatological teaching of 2 Thessalonians contains nothing to support the idea that it is referred to the Jewish situation after Paul Okay, so it's really just um, uh, imposing an idea upon what's actually there. Um, third argument is that 2 Thess Thessalonians is too similar to 1 Thessalonians. There's a lot of parallels, similarities, and we're going to see that in a moment. Um, so if there's so much similarity, why would Paul write two letters that are so much alike? It couldn't have been Paul who wrote the second letter. But then again, 2 Thessalonians has too much that is unlike 1 Thessalonians. So it also couldn't then be Paul. So the, these two arguments, well this one argument with its two aspects seem to contradict within itself. So there are similarities, there are verbal parallels between the letters. And you've got a chart on the next page that shows that. Both letters feature double thanksgiving. And a traditional benediction at the end. Um, the difference is 2 Thessalonians is more formal in tone than 1 Thessalonians and it has more eschatological teaching. Um, 1 Thessalonians expects the imminent return of Christ um, assuming that the, the, some of the believers might still be alive when Christ returns but 2 Thessalonians warns against thinking that the end is near so is the is the coming of christ near or is it far one thessalonians near two Th thessalonians far 
so uh, and and where does this man of lawlessness come in to the whole situation well there you have the chart in your in your notes and the the the, the similarities actually are very striking look at look at how both letters start in almost identical manner paul Silvanus and timothy to the church of the Thess thessalonians in god the father and the lord jesus christ um, it's identical Chap uh, chapter 1 verse 3 of 1 thessalonians your work of faith is mentioned there in chapter 1 verse 11 of, ch of 2 thessalonians every work of faith uh, faith love and steadfastness in in both 1 thessalonians 1 and 2 thessalonians 1 um, brothers loved by god or brothers beloved by the lord in both letters uh, for you remember brothers our labor and toil we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of god that's in 1 thessalonians 2 thessalonians with toil and labor we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you so paul is definitely repeating things that he said uh, in the first letter and coming to the same thing in the second he says finally then brothers in both letters um he talks about those who do not know God in both letters. And he talks of, and he ends with the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you in both letters. So there are definite similarities. Those similarities exist. Uh, vocabulary, style, structure. Um, but they're not because of different authors, but for the very reason that it is the same author. The same author can say the same things. The differences are about the level of theology, not different theology. Paul hasn't changed his theology when he goes from the first letter to the second letter. That's not the issue. It's the level of theology, how much emphasis or what he focuses on. Um, and also different sides of the same theology is a possibility. So whether or not Paul actually did change anything in his theology is, is not, not act the real issue. Um, he does, uh, he actually just places different emphasis in different situations. So there is a mixture of the imminence of the return of Christ as a warning sign, but also the other side that there is a, there is a, a future, it's a, it's a long term thing. So don't stop work, for example. So Paul is addressing both sides in the two letters. Then there's another argument that uh, Paul couldn't teach the eschatology of two Thessalonians because it would have been unpopular to the, the Christian community expecting the quick return of Christ. So would Paul have preached that, you know, um, you must get on with your work, don't expect Jesus to come immediately if, if it was unpopular to think like that? Well, of course, Paul would never be preaching to please his audience he was preaching what he knew from god to be the truth so that really doesn't make sense but basically that argument is well that kind of idea of a maybe it wouldn't be quite so soon that jesus return is then argued would be part of the general letters and would be later on uh, but we have no evidence that paul would ever have preached to conform to what was expected among the, his audience, whether they were Christian or not. Uh, the fourth argument, main argument, is that 2 Thessalonians is a pseudograph, a letter written by someone else using the name of Paul, a well-known figure. Um, and of course, pseudomus writing was common at the time, we have no, but we have no reason to believe that Paul's followers would have accepted something written in Paul's name but not from Paul or that they would even be deceived by someone claiming to to write uh, to be Paul uh, writing instead of him so that that argument really doesn't hold any weight so in conclusion there's no real reason to believe that two Thessalonians is not written by Paul okay regarding the time and place of writing I've hinted that, at this already in opening, in that um, Paul wrote uh, these letters quite soon, actually, after the church was established. 
during Paul's second missionary journey. So in his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul mentions his regret leaving so soon and he, his wishes to return to the believers, uh, yet not being able to. And he mentions that he decided to go alone to Athens. That's uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 1, and you can see it also in Acts 17 verse 15. So what had happened was that, we, as we read, Paul and Silas went on from Thessalonica and went eventually on to Berea and then to Athens. But Timothy stayed in Thessalonica. And it says in 1 Thess Thessalonians 3 verse 2, to establish and exhort you okay, in your faith. So Paul and S S Silas continued as Acts 17.10 um, reports and then Paul later left from Berea went to Athens and he left Silas in Berea but he sent the message that Timothy and Silas would, were to catch up with him when he uh, in Athens so he would be in Athens and they should come as soon as they could so after spending some time in Athens Paul left though for Corinth and, and he spent a lot of time in Corinth, as uh, that begins in Acts 18, chapter 1. Um, and so Silas and Timothy did eventually catch up with Paul in Corinth. So here Paul heard about the situation in, in Thessalonica, and that prompted him to write the first letter, and he sent it back with Timothy and um, Silas, or with other messengers. And that would have been somewhere around AD 50, during Paul's stay in Corinth, about only six months after he had first spent two or three weeks in Thessalonica and then was chased out uh, after a riot in the city. And then, so that's 1 Thessalonians, probably around AD 50, uh, about six months after Paul had been in Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians was written not very long after 1 Thessalonians, the messenger who delivered the first letter spent some time there with those believers, saw that some of the things had been misunderstood, that, that Paul had been teaching. And so when that messenger came back to Paul in Corinth, he reported that, and that prompted the writing of the second letter. So sometime probably in AD 51, 2 Thess Thessalonians was written still from Corinth during Paul's 18-month ministry in Corinth. Okay, so there's the time and place. Um, it's worth your while to, to, to not only read the first part of Acts 17, as, as I did with you, but to even go further and read into Acts chapter 18 and think about the, 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 the time and place of writing and linking that with the book of Acts and Paul's second missionary journey. So what was the occasion and pers purpose of writing? Why did Paul, what were, was Paul hearing about the church in Thessalonica that prompted him to want to write. So there's three things for 1 Thessalonians. Uh, the first purpose is to clear up any misconceptions about Paul's motives of why he left them so suddenly. Did he just not like them? Or was it really because there was this, this persecution that they really well knew? Um, but just to make sure there's no misconceptions about Paul's motives and his desire really to to be with them and to have an opportunity to teach them further then uh, secondly the second purpose of 1 Thessalonians is to remind the what the Thessalonians of the implications of their new faith and that's in in chapter 4 verses 1 to 12 especially being a believer has implications then thirdly he wants to comfort the believers over the deaths of some of their fellow Christians. And we're going to look uh, a little bit later at 1 Thessalonians in more detail. And we'll look at that passage in particular. Uh, I'll read for you 1 Thess Thessalonians 4, 13 to 5, 11. He, but Paul wants to comfort these believers. So he's clearing up misconceptions. He's reminding of the, them of what it means to be a believer. And... Uh, comforting them on the death of some of their fellow Christians. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul's ba basic purpose remains the same, but 
he's he's got some more details about what's going on in Thessalonica and he's seen that there's some specific problems so he deals with uh, a fresh outbreak of persecution he deals with errors regarding the return of Christ and the tendency to idleness based on a misunderstanding of how soon Jesus is going to return so that's two Thessalonians so the letters to the Thessalonians tackle these questions of eschatology or the eschatology of Paul and that will be become our focus as we continue with our study of 1 and 2 Thessalonians the return of Christ the sign of his coming the resurrection of believers the attitude of Christians in waiting for the coming of the Lord so there we have actually that's uh, our, we finished the first lecture lecture 13 so we might as well take a break there and then we'll continue with lecture 14 but I'm only going to take half of lecture 14 now because that will deal with one Thessalonians so we'll come back to that shortly